Guys, I'm Pastor Ben, like they said, um, and so I, I just want to warn you, I'm coming with a little bit of energy, okay? Are you guys ready? All right, all right, and so I just want to encourage you because I'm going to be giving you some energy. You can go ahead and give me some energy back, all right? And so I'm going to lay down that framework right up front, um, and so before we jump into the message, I just want to remind you, serve day is coming up. Like, serve day is a big deal, somebody. July 24th, and uh, who, who's leading a project? Can I just see your hand real quick? And so, okay, okay, then let me give you a challenge. There should be some more hands going up because we're never, we're never more like Jesus than when we're serving, than when we're the hands and the feet of Jesus. And, um, you know, sometimes I think that we, we feel like we're going to show up and we're going to go bless somebody, and then we find out that we're actually the ones to get more blessed. Um, and so I want to challenge you to go ahead, lead a project, um, and then maybe if you're not leading one, join one and get involved and, and love your neighbor. Amen? Um, before, we, before we jump into everything that I've got for us today, I always like to take a moment and just honor Pastor John and Miss Michelle. Um, they are incredible leaders, and God has blessed us and our house with their leadership. And, and you know, one of the things I love about Pastor John and Miss Michelle, there's so many, is that they, they never let a, a poor moment in somebody's life define them. Um, and and they all, they're always seeking and asking the Lord, God, God, what do you have for them? What did you say about them? And I just think that they are incredible. So can we just honor them real quick and clap and, and make some noise for them? And, and then um, while we're in the mode of honoring real quick, because I think honor looks so good on you. Like no matter what you do, when you go to the closet and you pull out honor, it'll always look good on you. And I want to take a moment and honor you, Pastor Matt Gates. Um, you know, you, you are a pillar to our church, and you've come alongside Pastor John and Miss Michelle, and, and there's been so much sacrifice that people don't see. Um, and I felt the Lord um, speak to me when we were ministering that, you, that you're, you're like a pillar of strength, like that white pillar, um, and, and, and you've, you've helped build the church here and what God has called Pastor John and Miss Michelle. And so on behalf of the family, I just wanted to say thank you and honor you. Um, He's probably not very happy with me about that. And so, um, hey, we're going to jump into the word today. Are you guys ready? So open up your Bibles. Go to Matthew chapter 3. And while we're turning there, um, I just want to encourage you to take notes. Note takers are history makers. I say it all the time because when you get God's word in the well of your heart, in due time, in due season, it'll come out of you. Maybe this word's for you right now, or maybe it's for you tomorrow. And, but I just encourage you, get it in your heart. And in fact, if you're one that's really great at taking notes, and I hope that you are, screenshot it and tag us at Life at Victory on Instagram or something like that so we can share the good news with the family. Amen? Um, so we're going to jump in. Uh, today I want to talk about how, how to handle our wilderness. How will you handle your wilderness? You know, temptations are coming. Temptations come, and, 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 but God is greater than, than the temptations that we face in life, and, and, um, and I believe that this message is going to bless you today. I also believe that this message will bless you tomorrow, and, and, and maybe sometime right around now on Wednesday. I believe that this message is a great message. It's a great tool for your toolbox, um, and that it will equip you and help you handle the things that happen in life. And, and so how, will, uh, how are we going to handle our temptation? So we're going to jump into two passages of Scripture. First is going to be Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17, and then Matthew 4, 1 through 11. So we're going to jump right in. Then Jesus came from Galilee, to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered him and said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I don't think God sounded anything like that, but, but there you go. And, and then um, in, in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, 40 days and 40 nights, 40 days and 40 nights, 
leading up to Encounter Conference, we just had our, our youth conference here, and it was, it was crazy what God did. It was incredible. And, uh, but leading up to that, and even leading up to this weekend, there were multiple times where, where I was fasting. I would do like, like a three-day fast, only water, as I was surrendering my flesh, and I wanted to make sure that I was hearing God accurately for some of the things that I, I felt that he was putting on my heart and, and for our community and for conference. And so, and, and I'm convinced that by day three, I'm convinced that Jesus actually caved in and had Chick-fil-A. Okay, I'm just saying, he went and got the Lord's fries. I'm convinced. And, and, but you know, I, I love when the Bible says, and it says something blatantly obvious, right? Like watch this, afterwards, he was hungry. I bet he was. I, I bet he was starving. And, uh, and now when the tempter had came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Did you guys just read what, what we just read? Did you see that? Did you see that? The devil himself, Satan, is quoting scripture to Jesus. Right there. It, it is, how you and I approach and apply the word of God is critical. It matters how we apply the, apply the word of God because it is a diabolical scheme of the enemy to try to get you to fit scripture into your life instead of you fitting your life in the scripture. You hear me today, church? Give me a better Amen. Because that will change your life. Then Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. I, I want to preach a message today, and I hope that you're taking notes. But you could go ahead and write down the title of our talk. It's called, How Will You Handle Your Wilderness? How will you handle your wilderness? Temptations are coming. Low moments are coming. How are we going to handle those? And I believe that today you'll be able to leave here with your head held high. I believe today that you've got a new tool for your toolbox, and you can be encouraged. Amen? Hey, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Father, I thank you that every word that comes out of my mouth that's of me, it falls to the ground and produces no fruit. But Lord, everything that's of you, everything, Father, let it take root in our heart, landing on good soil, Jesus, and producing good fruit. In your wonderful name, everybody said amen, amen and amen. Y'all, I'm so excited. This year, I, I get the honor and the privilege to celebrate and commemorate six years of full-time ministry. Six years. And, and, and I'm so excited because that's six years of getting to come alongside Pastor John and Miss Michelle. Six years of, of getting to serve our youth here at our church. And it, it has been so much fun. And, and I remember when I was in fifth grade, um, I remember I was sitting on a bus and I was about to go away to a science retreat. And so as I'm sitting on the bus, all these kids come walking by me, and, and, and as they were walking by, all of a sudden they started saying, what's up, Pastor Ben? What's up, Pastor Ben? Hey, Pastor Ben, like, you know, the chin check. Hey, hey, Pastor Ben, what's up? And, and I just was like, what, you, are you, like me? Like, no, like, you, you guys don't, like, you did, they didn't even know I was a Christian, let alone call me Pastor Ben. And I remember in that moment, I remember feeling like, no way. That I, I could never do that, and immediately I felt, the, I felt the Lord speak to my heart, like in my inward man, and I bared witness with me, and I just felt like when you grow up, you're going to be a pastor, and I said, shoot, no way, Lord, and, and so I didn't know how to handle it, and because I, I, I grew up in a church where we didn't have a strong youth group, I didn't know how to navigate what God was putting in my heart. Families, I got to tell you, if you've got a young child in this room and they're not plugged in in our children's church and our youth group, they need to get plugged in. They need to be about, around leaders that are helping them navigate what God's putting in their heart because that would have blessed me. 
that would have changed some things for me. In fact, because I didn't know how to navigate it, I actually beelined and ran the other way. And when I was 16 years old, I, I joined the, the volunteer fire department right next to my house in Burgesstown, Station 21. Can we just give a clap real quick for our first responders? You guys are awesome. It's incredible. And, um, and, and some of my greatest memories was when I was a volunteer fireman. Like, like I loved visiting the fire station. I loved being there. there there's something about rolling the hoses and, and cleaning the trucks. And, 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 and like if you have a fireman in your family, you know that there's fire pride. You know what I'm saying? That you just get excited. Like put the blue light on your truck, move out the way, okay? It's going down. Like get out the way, you know? And, and you just get, like there's a pride there. There's an energy and an excitement. And, and like you've got to understand to a young boy, a fire station is like Disney World without the ticket prices, okay? Like, it's, a, it's a, just a big deal. And, and so I remember being at the fire station and being so involved with everybody and, and cleaning the trucks and, and, and rolling hoses and literally sitting in the engine pretending to drive. And, and, like, if a little boy would come up to you and be like, hey, Ben, I got a fire truck, you'd be like, I drive one, hashtag dream bigger. You know what I'm saying? Like, just that pride, that energy that comes fr from it. And, and, and I'll never forget forget I'll never forget when I was at the fire station and and one afternoon I'm sitting inside one of the engines real big engine pretending to drive it I'm, I'm winding up the siren I'm pulling the horn you know I'm just oh man I'm pumped and and all of a sudden like my, my my chief is right next to me he's standing outside the window all of a sudden the alarm goes off and and over the intercom I, I hear station 21 Station 21, we have a five alarm house fire. And I mean, immediately, my chief went from laughing and fellowshipping with me and joking to grabbing me by the shirt and saying, son, get out of the truck. And I mean, it was like if you were to step on an ant bed and ants come everywhere. We had firemen running in from outside. Two guys were playing ping pong. In the middle of ping pong, they throw their paddles. They run to the truck. Another man's putting on his gears. This other guy's sitting there in mid bite of a turkey sandwich, drops the turkey sandwich and runs to the truck. And within just three minutes, the same truck that I was pretending to drive is now peeling out of the driveway to destiny. And I'll never forget the look on my chief's face. The moment that he had to quickly transition from fellowship with me to racing to put out a fire that he did not start. And I share my childhood memory with you in a feeble uh, uh, attempt to accurately articulate the tones and the tensions that our Savior is going through right here. The whiplash that is happening. What's, what's going on in Matthew chapter 3 when Jesus gets baptized and then Matthew 4 when he faces the temptations. Because in chapter 3 with his baptism, he's in complete fellowship with the Father. But in Matthew 4, with his temptations, he, he, he's now racing to put out a fire that he did not start, but was started in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and got the world in the mess that it's in today. And the tension is in that transition between Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4. And first of all, I want you to understand that the chapters... And the numbers in your Bible, the verses that are printed in your Bible, although they are very helpful, they sometimes can be a hindrance and actually stop you from getting the context of the text in which you should be reading. And, and so if you're not careful, you'll end up doing what I've done for years, which is to read about Jesus and his baptism in Matthew 3, pause for a commercial break, go make popcorn, put butter on your popcorn, and then pick back up and read about his temptations in Matthew chapter 4. And, and you'll be tempted to look at these two passages and view them as isolated events and, and viewed independently. But I submit to you today that these two events are not to be viewed independently, but rather dependently because God is actually giving us Biblical blues clues of how you and I, what we are going to face in our life as a believer. There is a trajectory that your life will go through. Like, like something that you are going to face that is inevitable. And I came to tell you today that there is a connection between the water and the wilderness. The water and the wilderness. The water and the wilderness. Maybe 
maybe I read the, the wrong passage of scripture today. Maybe I shouldn't have read Matthew and I should have read our boy Marky Mark's account. And, and so let's take a look at what Mark says in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. He said, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And in verse 12 it says, immediately. Immediately. Immediately, no chapter break, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, and tempted by Satan, he was with the wild beasts. See, it's that immediately that's a big deal. Somebody say big deal. One moment he's being baptized, the next moment he's in a battle. One moment he's in total comfort, the next moment he's in total conflict. One moment he's in cohesive community, the next moment he's in complete isolation. One moment he's getting a word from heaven, the next moment he's getting the word from hell. One moment he's getting water, the next moment he's in the wilderness and he's facing very real warfare. Come on, don't act like you haven't been there before. How is it that you can be at a church service like this experiencing God's glory, God's power, God's presence, and the very next moment, it's like the enemy puts a laser beam from hell right on your back. One moment, you're, you're stepping out in great faith in what God has called you to do, and the next moment, fear has gripped your heart. One moment, you, you want to pray for your enemies and bless those that curse you. The next moment, you want to speak to all your haters in a tongue that needs no interpretation. Do you know what it feels like to be in that transition from the water to the wilderness? The water and the wilderness, there, there is tension in the transition. And so before I talk about what happened in the wilderness, I first want to discuss what happened in the water. Because you got to understand today that Jesus and his baptism is a big deal. I mean, it's a really big deal. In fact, it's such a big deal that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of the Gospels, they all record this. They all experience Jesus' experience in the water. But note, I think it is very interesting that two of them don't even talk about Christmas. They don't even talk about the birth of Jesus. In fact, Mark and John, they skip Christmas you got to be some kind of next-level gangster if you're going to skip Christmas. Okay, I'm just saying right there. And they, and they don't even deem it necessary, but all of them talk about what Jesus experienced in the water because it's a big deal. And I just got to say that if Jesus, our Lord, our Master, got baptized, and you haven't been baptized, water baptized, what are you waiting for? Like, if Jesus did it, you know your cray-cray self. Like, what you waiting for? Go get baptized, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and maybe it's time that, that you, because you've been married to Jesus, but you haven't been wearing your wedding ring, and maybe it's time to put on your wedding ring and let the world know. Go get water baptized, because it's a big deal. Jesus' baptism was a big deal, and I know that it was a big deal, because when the Bible says that when Jesus got baptized, that immediately the heavens opened up immediately, immediately the heavens opened up. You know when the, the heavens open up, the atmosphere has shifted. You know when the heavens open up that something's going to happen. You know when the heavens open up that you're going to get a word from heaven. Come on, that's why you came to church today. It's not so that, so that you could have a cute church service. You came so that the heavens could open up in this place and you could experience God's glory, God's power, and God's presence. Come on, church. Amen. So when the, when the heavens open up, I know it's gonna, something's going to happen. And so I know Jesus' baptism was a big deal simply because of who showed up on the scene. Because for the first time and only time in the New Testament, we have the whole Godhead, the whole Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They make a cameo experience at the, at the very uh, appearance at the very same time. They all show up. You got God the Father making a declaration. 
you've got God the Son being baptized in the water, and you've got the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. So, so when the Holy Trinity shows up, this is a big deal. It's a significant moment. And I know that it's a significant moment simply because of what the Father was declaring over Jesus. The Father was not declaring a random word. The Father was declaring truth. The same truth that he declares over you and I, that you've got to know, that you've got to know, that you've got to know. And, 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 and this, this truth got to be an anchor to our soul, that whenever life comes against you, the Father was declaring something that you've got to know, that you know, that you know, that you know, that no matter what you're facing today, no matter what you're going through, and that truth is this, that I am loved, I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. I am loved, I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. I am loved, I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. Oh, I'm going to say it till you get it. I am loved, I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. Say it with me. I am loved, I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. That truth right there, how many know it will change your life if you get it? I'm telling you the moment that that's cemented in your soul, that you know that you are loved, you're a child of God, and he is pleased with you. That'll change the way that you walk into a room. That'll change your swag. That'll change the way that you hold your head up. You wouldn't lose your joy so easily if you knew that you were a child of God and that he's pleased with you. And I want, I want to give you a dare. I know we're in church, but I'm going to give you a dare. Every morning, every morning when you wake up, before you go brush your teeth, stinky breath and all, I want you to stand right in front of the mirror, and I, I just want you to declare over yourself that I am loved, I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. That would be a great way to start your day. Hear me, church, because this is where most believers stop. We always stop at the water. Don't get me wrong. The water is significant because the water is the place where your identity is confirmed. The water is the place where you find out who you are and whose you are. Note, when the Father makes this declaration over Jesus, this is before he's done a single miracle. He hadn't walked on water yet. He hadn't healed anybody yet. He hadn't cast out demons. He didn't multiply the two fish and the five loaves and make the first red lobster yet. He didn't get off the cross yet. Didn't get up out of the grave. This is a big deal. And the Father still says that you are loved. You're my child and I'm pleased with you. How? He hadn't done anything yet. I know, but this has nothing to do with performance. It has everything to do with proximity and relationship with me. It has, it has every, faith is what pleases me. Faith is what pleases him. You've got to know today, child of God, you've got to know today that the Lord is pleased with you. Why is God pleased with you? Because you made the decision to point your feet in his direction. You made the decision to show up. And the word says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So your decision today was to grow in faith. And faith is the only thing that pleases God. So you want to please God, grow in faith, and then activate your faith and walk in it. Amen? And, and, and that's, where, that's where most people stop. So you leave a good church service like this. And you're like, boy, woo! Do you hear what the pastor said? Oh, oh, man, it was good. I am loved. I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. And you feel so good in the water. But I felt the need to warn you that immediately, that when you go from the water, you're going to go from the wilderness. And right after you hear the voice of heaven, friend, you will hear the voice of hell. And that's what messes us up as believers. Because we've almost been programmed and conditioned to think that once I have the approval of heaven, that I won't have an attack from the enemy. People, we've almost re relegated the approval of God to a better car, a better house, a better job, a fat check that we get. And oh, man, did you see my new kicks? They're white. He is pleased with me. Oh, man. And, and, and listen, and, 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 and we have relegated it to blessings. I'm all about blessings. I'm for blessings on blessings on blessings on blessings. I believe God will bless you just because he loves you. I also believe that, that God wants to bless you so that he can get a blessing to you and then through you. I believe that. But the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus is proof positive that the approval of heaven does not absolve you from an attack from the enemy. As a matter of fact, I'd go further to say that some of you, the reason why you're facing what you're facing right now is simply because God is pleased with you. 
You didn't do something wrong. You actually did something right. And that's why all hell is coming against you. Conversely, the reason why some of you, your life is perfect and has you tiptoeing through the tulips and Kool-Aid coming out of your water fountain is because you haven't done anything with your life. You, your, your life is stagnant. You haven't upset the kingdom of darkness. But when you start standing up for God and you start saying, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, and you start kicking demons out of your city and out of your towns, I'm telling you, all hell gets nervous and demons start to tremble. I came to tell you today, receive the smile, but don't get shocked when you get the scowl from hell. It's the smile of heaven that will attract the scowl from hell. The smile of heaven will attract the scowl from hell. And God has this ability to take us from the water to the wilderness. From the water to the wilderness, from the water to the wilderness. I'm going to say it to you, get it from the water to the wilderness. And now... I see why the children of Israel had to go through the Red Sea, because the Red Sea was comprised of water. And, 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 and the water is the place where your identity is confirmed, and Pharaoh thought that they were just slaves, but they were not just slaves. They were, they were children of God, and they were loved, and he was pleased with them. And, and when you are God's child, there's no bondage, there's no stronghold, there's no addiction, there's no cancer that can hold you back and hold you down, because who the, who, who, God sets you free, amen? Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Moses had to lift up his staff and split the water. But they didn't go straight into the promised land. They went into the wilderness. And they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. And, and God has this ability to take us from the water to the wilderness. And I've learned in my life not to be too quick to judge people because you never know the wilderness that somebody is born into. And the wilderness is a very real place. And it's in the wilderness, in the heat of the wilderness, that, that it seeks to evaporate your experience in the water. And that can leave us with daunting questions like, who am I? What difference do I make? Where do I belong? And how do I handle anxiety and depression? And here's the question that you've got to answer before we leave today. How are you going to handle the temptations that we face in the wilderness? How are you going to handle it? How will you handle your temptations? See, this is the, this is the water. But Monday's coming. Wednesday's coming. You've got to go back home. You've got to go back to work. Some of you, school's going to be coming up. That's the wilderness and the tensions in the transition. And, and, I, and I need you to see today that the same spirit that descended on Jesus in the water is the same spirit that led him into the wilderness. The spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. That means the wilderness is not the problem. The problem is who's in the wilderness posted up, waiting and watching and waiting for you to get there. Satan was already in the wilderness posted up waiting for Jesus to get there. He did not open his mouth. He did not clear his throat until after Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was already in the wilderness waiting for him, waiting and watching and waiting and watching. That's what the enemy does. He waits, he watches, and then he attacks. It's his tactic. He did it in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. What did he do? He slithered in there as a serpent. He waited, he watched, and he attacked. As a snake, he did this. I, I love the Discovery Channel. When I was watching a special, I almost, I almost changed the channel because I can't do snakes. And it was a special on snakes. And they just give me the heebie-jeebies. This, this is going to mess you up. They, they, did, they did this special on snakes. And um, I'm glad I watched it because it blew my mind. It, 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 and they said that snakes are, are one of the only species that never blink. Just waiting and watching for an opportunity to attack. The enemy does the same thing to you, waiting and watching for an opportunity to attack. I, I, watched, I watched another special on, on snakes. Ugh, sorry for snake stories today. I'm just going to give them to you. And, and so it was this woman. She, she went to the veterinarian because she had a pet snake, and her snake was sick. And so when she gets there, she has her snake, and, and she starts to ask the veterinarian a litany of questions. And she's going through and, and trying to figure out why, like, my, my snake is not well. What is going on? And, and so he's looking at her, looking at the snake, and 
looking at him, looking at her, looking at him. And, and so they're going through all of these questions, and he's like, you know, what is your snake eating? She's like, yeah, he's not eating. It's, it's, it's been like almost two months, the snake's not eating. He's like, okay. And, and, and so she, he, he keeps going through these questions. Finally, he goes, you know what, I'm going to say something. This is a little bit strange. I'm just going to throw it out there. I know it's going to sound weird, but I'm just going to get it out there. He said, by chance, is there any way possible that maybe, okay, are you sleeping with your snake at night? She goes, <laughs> Veterinarian, I, actually, I, actually, I am. You know, I, I just get lonely at night, and he's a, a python. He's not venomous, and, and the cage is right next to me. Oh, that's a whole next level of cray-cray, okay, right there. I'm just going to say. And, and so, so he continues to ask her questions. He said, okay, well, you know, when, when you wake up, your snake's next to you. Yeah, he's next to me, okay. Um, it, like, so is he, like, right next to you? Yeah, no, no, like, right next to me. Okay, what, like, what is he doing? Oh, he's kind of, like, stretched out, like, Stretched out from head to toe. Yeah, from head to toe. And he said, okay, all right. I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is your snake's not sick. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, oh, Lord, oh, I, got, I was so nervous. And, but what's the bad news? The bad news is the reason why your snake is refusing to eat is because it's actually preparing to eat you. The reason why your snake has not eaten in several months is because your snake is strategically orchestrating its digestive system so that it has enough room for you. The reason why you wake up to your, to your snake right next to you, stretched out beside you, is because it's sizing you up, looking to see how how big it has to become to swallow you whole. And the woman goes, really? And I think that's how we act as believers. You, you, you think that the enemy likes that you're at church? You think the enemy likes that you're going to be stepping in your purpose and your calling? You think that the enemy likes that, that you're going to lift up the name of Jesus and walk in all that he has for you? No, he's trying to destroy you. But I got good news because he's already been defeated. It's what Jesus did on the cross that set you and I free. Look, I didn't come today to tell you all these snake stories. But I did want you to be aware that you've got a very real enemy who is watching, he's waiting, and he's trying to destroy you. And he will do it in the wilderness. He will do it in seasons of vulnerability. He will do it in those low moments. That's when he attacks. And if you are going to win the war in your wilderness, then you have to have a strategy. You've got to have a plan. And so I'm going to give you four quick thoughts in four minutes. And then we're done. And so I encourage you to take notes. And here's, here, here they are. Number one is you've got to know where you are. Where are you? What season of life is this for you? See, the enemy attacked Jesus at the beginning of his ministry because the enemy loves to battle you at the beginning. He was trying to destroy Jesus before he ever got started. And some of you wonder why the enemy's been attacking you since the day that you were born. It's because he knows the plan and the purposes that God has for your life. He's trying to take you out. He's been trying to destroy you, but look at you. You're still here. You're still standing here. He even attacked Jesus when he was right at the end, when he was on the cross. A voice in the crowd uh, cried out, he, he, he saved others. Why doesn't he come off and, and save himself? Trying to get Jesus to come off of the cross and abort his mission because he was right at the edge of our redemption. Sometimes when you're right at the finish line, when you're right there, the enemy tries to attack you the most. You can't quit right now. You can't quit right now. You can't. Come on, you're right on the edge of your redemption. You're right on the edge of your breakthrough. You're right on the edge of what God has for you. Where are you? Number two, if you're going to win the war in your wilderness, you have to know the word is your weapon. The word is your weapon. With every attack, what did Jesus do? He spoke the word of God. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. It was like it was a Drake mixtape. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. God's word is your only weapon. Don't miss this. Please don't miss this. Family, you can't miss this. If you're going to catch anything today, you got to catch this. Don't miss this. In the water, the word came over Jesus. In the wilderness, the word came out of Jesus. See, as, as church people, sometimes we can get it twisted. 
We go into the wilderness and what do we want? We want a good word over us. Oh, Pastor Ben, I've been going through hell on earth. Oh, I just, you gotta bring something good today. Get me something good, get me something good. And, and we want a good word over us. In the wilderness, you need more than a good sermon over you. You need more than a good word over you, but the word coming out of you to fight back against the enemy. And it can't come out of you if you've never put it in you. The word is your weapon. Number three, if you're going to win the war in your wilderness, you have to know what's at stake. What's at stake? One of the reasons, just one of the million reasons that I love Jesus is Jesus made decisions with my destiny in mind. He looked through, he, he looked at humanity through the, the lens of love and with every decision he was thinking about us. Every decision, not just on the cross, not just when he got up out the grave, but he was thinking about us in the water and he was thinking about us in the wilderness. And here's how I know that he was thinking about us in the water, because he got baptized in the first place. Come on. If anybody could skip water baptism, it's Jesus, right? He's like at the top of the line. He's at the top of the list. Water baptism's about the old you going under and the new you coming up. This is the perfect son of God. There is no old him. Come on, he created John the Baptist. He spoke water into existence and he knew what's at stake. He said, John, this isn't about me. It's, it's not about me, John. It's about who's coming after me. I didn't just come to die the death that they were supposed to die. I came to live the life that they're supposed to live. John, you've got to baptize me so I can be the perfect example. Satan, I, I can't turn the stones into bread because if I do so and I eat of it, I'm no better than Adam himself who ate of the forbidden fruit and brought sin into the world. He knew what was at stake. And when you're in your wilderness, don't forget what's at stake. Don't forget what's at stake. How will you handle your wilderness? How will you handle those temptations? You cannot give in to temptation. It's not just about you. There are people that are coming after you. There are people that are watching you. You're an ambassador for Christ. So much more is caught than taught. What's at stake? Listen, all the decisions that you make today will determine the stories that you tell tomorrow. What's at stake? Number four, and I'm done. We're going to close with this. To win the war in your wilderness, you've got to know where your help comes from. With every attack, every attack that the enemy launched, he tried his best to get his worship. Come on, you know that's what the enemy tries to do to you. You want your worship. Some of you, you came in today and you wanted to lift your hands. You wanted to lift your voice. But the enemy kept reminding you of that problem at home. The enemy kept reminding you of that situation. The enemy kept reminding you of the addiction and the problems and the relational tensions that we face. And he's trying to bring up your past mistakes because he's trying to get you to be quiet. I came to tell you that in the wilderness, don't you lose your worship. Don't you lose your worship. You might not understand what's going on, but you don't have to worry about what's going on around you. You've got you've to look to the God that's above you. Come on, He's where your strength comes from. Would you stand to your feet? Stand to your feet. He's where our strength comes from. He's an ever-present help in times of need. Let's begin to worship Him right now. Come on. God is good. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, you stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the you march me out of freedom into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. You're the God who fights for me.
giving him your worship. Keep giving him your worship. Lord, we worship you. Father, we praise you. Lord, we lift your name up. We magnify you, the name above all names, the King of all kings. Lord, we worship you. Father, you're where our strength comes from. You're our shelter. You're the fortress that we run to. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. In low moments, when temptations come, and I, I don't know what the temptation looks like for you, the Word is your weapon. The Word is your weapon. God wants to do something in this moment, so I want to hang out for a second. I just want to hang out for a second. You can lift your hands. You can worship. You can make a joyful noise to the Lord. He's the one that created the heavens and the earth. He's the one that sets captives free. Lord, I thank you that right now you're exposing things. Lord, I thank you that right now, as we give you place right now, Lord, that you're bringing healing and that you're mending right now, Lord. After service, after service, we're going to have prayer partners up front. And I felt the Lord put in my heart that there's things that we do in secret. That there's things that are in darkness, if you will. And when we come up to the prayer partners and we expose those things, when we bring it into the light, we're placing them in His hands. And that's when freedom starts. That's when healing starts. Because then Jesus is in control. But when you keep things hidden, when you keep things in darkness, you're actually giving the enemy place and you're giving him rule and I believe that today God is setting us free I don't think it's coincidence that today this weekend that we're celebrating Independence Day free from control we're free from control and I believe that today is a day that you can mark on your calendar it's your Independence Day it's the day that you're free that you're not bound by addiction or any stronghold, you are free. Because who the sun sets free is free indeed. And that's what God's doing today. That's your portion. That's what's yours. That's what Jesus did for you. That's what he did for me. And that's what we get to receive today. So before we get to that moment, maybe you've come in here and we've talked a lot about the good news of Jesus and how good he is and how much he loves us and maybe today you've never even started a relationship with him. He wants nothing but the best for you. He wants nothing more than to walk with you and to talk with you and to spend time with you. So today, I wanna to give you that opportunity that if you came in here and you haven't made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, if you haven't surrendered your life to him, I wanna pray with you. In fact, right where we are, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if we declare with our mouth, in other words, we pray. We're about to pray in a minute. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose from the grave three days later, you'll be saved. In a moment, we're about to pray. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life that no man comes to the Father except through me. So it doesn't doesn't matter how much good you do, although you should do a lot of good. But that's not it. It's your relationship with Him. It's your relationship with Him. It's your relationship with Him. So if this is you, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads. If this is you, and you want to invite Jesus into your life to start a relationship with Him, would you slip up your hand right where you are? 
We're all going to pray together, but if this is you, would you just slip up your hand right where you are? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. We're all going to pray together. Would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I believe with all my heart that you're the Son of God, and you died on the cross for me, purchased my sin debt, set me free, and I'm a child of God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, somebody. That's good news today. That's good news today.